Are you searching for just one rule, or are you searching for multiple rules, or this gets into the whole concept of the Rouliad, is it possible that all rules could be applied to the universe? Yeah, uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's pretty uncontroversial to say I don't think we're searching for one rule. That's something where I think the, if you like, the branding of the project has maybe changed. There was a, a TED talk that I know Stephen gave back in like 2010 or something, where he, he really talked about this as a serious thing he wanted to try to do. Yeah. He famously said, before the end of the decade, I want to launch a project yes. to try and find the fundamental theory <laughs> of physics. And he very much counted it in these terms of, we're going to do a systematic search and we're going to see if we can find the rule for our universe. Yeah. I don't consider that to be particularly plausible, and I don't think Stephen does either anymore. Yeah. And a lot of it comes down to the thing we said at the beginning about, I mean, you made the point, the very important point about, you know, I and many other people are essentially agnostic about you know whether the universe is really discrete or continuous and and again i, I said part of the reason that i i have that almost apathy to work to, to, to the underlying <laughs> ontology is because i think that there's a sense in which we can say okay we can define a kind of equivalence class or a congruence class of different models that all have the same observational consequences and then if they have the same observational consequences it's really a kind of it's only, it's only on philosophical or aesthetic criteria that we can say that one of these is more accurate as a, or, or better as a model of physics than the other. Yeah. The analogy that I use quite a lot is Lagrangian versus Hamiltonian mechanics, right? So, you know, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics are mathematically equivalent. They are observationally equivalent. It's not like, you know, it's not like one is right and one is wrong. You can't do an experiment that distinguishes Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. But ontologically, they're very different. Yeah. Hamilton's equations are very local in time. Whereas, you know, Lagrangian mechanics is teleological, it's kind of global in time, it's, it, it's about shaping the behavior of the system towards some teleological goal. But of course, we know you can derive Hamilton's equations from the Lagrange principle and vice versa. And, you know, we see the same thing with interpretations of quantum mechanics and, and lots of other things. And I think that teaches us an important lesson, that actually when it comes to kind of fundamental theories, the best I think we can reasonably hope for is some kind of equivalence class of theories that maybe have very different ontologies, but are observationally isomorphic. And yeah. so that's, in a sense, I think the best case scenario for this model, too, is that I don't think it's the case we'll find one rule that reproduces physics. What we, can, what we might be able to find in the best case is some equivalence class of rules that produce hypergraph behaviors that are all compatible with observations that we're able to make of the physical universe. And there might be some nice characterization for what those rules have in common that mean that they effectively successfully reproduce physics. But I don't think, yeah. I think it's extremely unlikely that we'll have any kind of systematic scientific way of distinguishing which one of those rules is correct. I think, you know, just yeah. as everyone has their favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics, probably everyone will end up having their favorite hypergraph rule that reproduces observed phenomena. So there'll be religious wars over which <laughs> rule is right, even though there's no way to actually provably choose one over the other. <laughs> well, I guess that depends how pessimistic you are about, <laughs> about the human condition, but it's at least, it's certainly not uh, implausible that something like that might happen. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so you, you bring up this, this point about the Rouliad, I mean, I'm to lay my own cards on the table. I mean, I'm 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 somewhat skeptical about the usefulness of the Rouliad as a concept. I mean, I think it's useful as a it's useful as a thinking tool. Let, let me let, that's yeah. maybe the, the uh, that's maybe the charitable way I can I can formulate it. When you think about trying to devise a, a fundamental model for a phenomenon like the physical universe, there are kind of two, particularly if it's based on computation, there are sort of two extremes that you could try and use. And they're, they're, it's actually, again, it's related to the thing I mentioned at the beginning about the kind of axiomatic view of mathematics versus the constructivist view of mathematics. So the constructivist view, which is a kind of extreme bottom-up view, is like you start from nothing, you start from, or you start from some very basic computational structure, like a hypernode or whatever, and then you build up from there to the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. That's, kind of, that's the essence of constructivism or, or bottom-up model building. Then there's what in mathematics you would characterize as the axiomatic view, or the kind of top-down view of, of, of science, which is more like you say, well, let's start from all possible structures, let's start from all possible computations or something, and then let's make restrictions, let's impose constraints yeah. that eventually get us down to the thing that we, want to, that, we, that we want to explain or we want to observe or measure or whatever. And that's really what mathematical axioms do. In mathematics, you have what is often called the domain of discourse, or for set theory, it's the universe of all possible sets. And then you write down axioms that restrict you know, precisely the place restrictions on precisely which sets you're talking about until eventually you've unambiguously defined a group or a ring or a topological space or whatever it is. So traditional axiomatic mathematics is much more like this top-down view and the fancy, rebellious, 20th century constructivist, intuitionist view of mathematics is much more like this kind of bottom-up view. 
So traditionally, with the physics project, we've tended to think in this bottom-up way of like, we start from yeah. nothing and we try and build up these models. But the point is that you could also imagine considering the extreme top-down view where you start from all possible computations being instantiated and you make restrictions. And that's really, I think, to the extent that I understand it, that's really, I think, what the, what the kind of Rouliad idea is, is about. Yeah. And my own, my own philosophical leanings are that, okay, I think that both things are useful as thinking tools. But like yeah. all extremes, I think that the, the most fruitful, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a kind of middle ground kind of person. I think that I think we, yeah. we can learn useful things from both approaches. But I think ultimately the model that will end up being most useful in the sense of being somehow minimal or most elegant or, you know, minimal with respect to algorithmic information theory or something will end up having features of both. It, it will be somewhere in the middle. It won't be completely bottom up, but it also won't be completely top down. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.